ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. And welcome to the Q4 2019 KForce Inc. Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star then 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Michael Blackman, Chief Corporate Development Officer. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good morning. Before we get started, I would like to remind you that this call may contain certain statements that are forward-looking. These statements are based upon current assumptions and expectations and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results may vary materially from the factors listed in K-Force's public filings and other reports and filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We cannot undertake any duty to update any forward-looking statements. I would now like to turn the call over to David Dunkel, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Dave? Thank you, Michael. You can find additional information about this quarter's results and our earnings released in our SEC filings. In addition, we have published our prepared remarks within the Investor Relations portion of our website. Unless otherwise indicated, our commentary relates to results from our continuing operations. I'd like to begin by providing some commentary on 2019 and the activities completed to position our firm for significant future success. Last year, with the successful divestitures of our KGS and trauma FX businesses, we completed a multi-year effort to exit all non-core businesses and focus our offerings solely on the domestic technical and professional staffing and solutions markets. The completion of these efforts positions us to allocate our investments and dedicate our resources to growing our footprint and service offerings in technology and areas within finance and accounting, which complement the massive data and digital transformation efforts taking place within all organizations. These combined segments make up one of the largest and arguably most strategic investments to the long-term success of organizations served by specialty staffing and solutions firms. Technology now comprises nearly 80% of overall revenues. Clients looking to meet their talent needs in technology are looking for partners that are able to provide resources at scale across a diverse range of skill sets and project management models, across multiple geographies and with a focus on compliance. We've built a business that is able to do just that without distraction, and it is helping us to increase clients and market share. Our shareholders gained immediate benefit from the 2019 divestitures through our repurchase of approximately 13% of outstanding shares, utilizing the approximately $102 million of net proceeds derived from the transactions. We were able to recapture all of the earnings per share lost from the KGS operations through the EPS accretion of the share repurchases by the end of the year, resulting in a highly focused more profitable firm going forward. Additionally, in 2019, we continued to invest in technology and process improvements aimed at enhancing the experience of our clients and candidates and improving the productivity of our associates. With respect to our financial performance during 2019, we were successful at once again driving significant above-market growth in our TechFlux business, which increased 6.8% over 2018. Our compound annual growth rate in TechFlex revenues over the last 10 years has been 8.5%. We also significantly improved our profitability in 2019, as demonstrated by a 13.4% increase in earnings per share in return on invested capital for the year of approximately 25%. As we look ahead, demand for technology resources continues to be quite strong. Every organization across every industry is being confronted with the imperative to invest and rapidly adapt to ever-changing business models, new competitors, and the changing preferences of their customers. Market-leading companies understand the value of a flexible resource model to execute on the project work necessary to address this changing landscape where specialized skills, speed, and flexibility are critical without sacrificing quality. Discussions with many of these companies indicate leveraging flexible resources within their technology teams to meet these project-driven needs remains a vital element of their overall talent strategy. 
These companies are also increasingly looking for their partners, such as KFORS, to both provide the resources necessary to execute on critical projects and to assume a greater role in more complex technical projects that require managed teams and solutions. Our clients have increasingly expressed a desire to engage with us to serve as an effective, more cost-efficient alternative or complement to the larger-scale integrators, as evidenced by our success in recently winning several strategic engagements. This growing demand significantly expands our addressable market into the IT services market, which is significantly larger than the $30 billion domestic technology staffing market. We believe the the secular drivers of demand in technology have fundamentally changed the trajectory and persistence of technology investments and utilization of flexible labor to meet this demand. Given the strength in these secular drivers, we would expect the performance of the domestic technology market to perform well, relatively speaking, even during adverse macroeconomic environments. Our confidence in the continued strength in our business and in our future operating cash flows is further demonstrated by our Board of Directors' approval of an 11% increase in our dividend to $0.80 per share annually, effective in the first quarter. I also wanted to update you on our Board of Directors' refreshment activities. Over the last five years, we have added three new members to our board, Ann Dunwoody, Randall Mell, and John Simmons, each bring unique and valuable experience to the board. These additions have been made knowing three longtime board members would at some point choose to step down after long and distinguished tenures. Last week, John Allred, Richard Cochiero and Gordon Tunstall each informed the board that they would not stand for re-election at the April 2020 annual shareholders meeting. These three outstanding individuals have been critical partners and advisors to our firm from its entrance into the public markets through all stages of its growth. We have been very blessed by their service, and they will be missed. However, The additions we have made results in a more diverse and independent board that should serve shareholders well in the upcoming years. We are looking forward to celebrating our 25th year as a public company. As a moment of reflection, our total shareholder return since going public has been approximately 1,200%, roughly two and a half times greater than the Russell 2000 over the same period. Given that we are in the early innings of the massive digital transformation of the U.S. economy, We believe the future of K-Force has never been brighter. I'll now turn the call over to Joe Liberatore, President, who will give greater detail into our operating results and trends, and then Dave Kelly, CFO, will add further color on fourth quarter results, our intentions with the use of cash proceeds, and provide guidance on Q1. Joe? Thank you, Dave, and thanks to all you for your interest in K-Force. Before I begin discussion on our fourth quarter results, I'd like to echo Dave's comments and specifically congratulate and thank our team on the progress we've made over the course of many years. We have built a platform, team, and client portfolio that should allow us to consistently outperform our competitors in meeting client needs for technology and key finance and accounting talent across industries and skill sets. We believe that focus will win in a future where the war for top talent is intense and the demands of the clients are growing significantly given the strong secular drivers. As it relates to our fourth quarter performance, total revenues of $336.2 million were within our range of guidance, but certainly below our expectations due to a number of factors that I'll enumerate throughout these remarks. Let me begin the quarterly discussion by providing some details about the performance in each of our business lines. Our technology business continues to be our growth driver and now has exceeded the market growth rate for the ninth consecutive quarter. In the fourth quarter, our technology flex business grew 4.8% year over year. The operating trends in this business sustained the strong trends we experienced in Q3 through October and the majority of November. However, As we entered the holiday season, we saw a significant increase in year-end planning activities by some of our large clients, both to minimize fourth quarter expense and also secure crucial talent for the upcoming year. Specifically, we saw more significant furlough activity than we had anticipated, coupled with a spike in conversions, which were almost 50% greater than the already elevated levels experienced in the fourth quarter of 2018. 
We also experienced some client-specific consultant ends at levels we hadn't anticipated, particularly in the financial services industry vertical. These factors negatively impacted TechFlex performance in the quarter and also reduced the base of billable consultants on assignments coming into the new year, which consequently will negatively impact first quarter revenues. As it relates to our portfolio management strategy, we believe our continued focus on diversifying our activities beyond our largest clients, but within our existing client base, which includes relationships with roughly 70% of the Fortune 500, is the right path. These companies continue to be the largest consumers of technology talent and have been driving our growth. The growth in these clients during 2019 allowed us to continue to generate above market growth rates even while some of our largest clients have experienced declines. With respect to the industries we serve, we are well diversified within our portfolio. We experienced year-over-year growth in eight out of our top 10 industries with particular strength in business professional services, insurance, manufacturing products, and healthcare. However, we experienced broad weakness in our financial services vertical, which was down approximately 5% year over year. Overall average bill rates in technologies increased 3.5% year over year, but were stable sequentially. Our strong relationships, the nature and quality of skilled technology talent we provide our clients, and the way in which technology projects are executed is contributing to a higher average duration of client assignments which is nearly 10 months. We believe this trend may remain at historic high levels due to the scarcity of supply and the growth we are experiencing in higher value-add managed teams and solution projects, which continue to grow faster than our core tech flex business. Given the trends we experienced late in the quarter, we expect that year-over-year growth rates in our tech flex business may decelerate slightly from fourth quarter 2019 levels as we continue repositioning resources to clients demonstrating ongoing high levels of demand. Our FA Flex business declined 7.6% year over year. Trends in this business were stable from Q3 to Q4 as revenues grew sequentially on a billing day basis for the second consecutive quarter. However, a discrete project in the fourth quarter last year to support hurricane relief efforts which distorts year-over-year trends and drove a higher year-over-year decline did not reoccur this year. The market for our FA Flex business continues to be stable, and we expect year-over-year declines to decelerate into low single digits in the first quarter of 2020. Direct hire revenue decreased 6.6% year-over-year, primarily as a result of seasonal declines. Our direct hire business continues to be an important capability in ensuring that we can meet the talent needs of our clients through whatever means they prefer. We have typically experienced a sequential improvement in direct hire revenues in the first quarter. However, initial trends to the start of the quarter have been softer than expected. We believe this is partially due to the timing of the holiday, but also due to the continued tightness of the labor markets where highly skilled professionals have many options and are receiving multiple offers and heightened levels of counteroffers. We continue to make significant technology and process investments in order to drive further improvements in our associate productivity. We are particularly focused on our new talent relationship management system, which we expect will be available to our associates midway through 2020. We also continue to make technology investments focused in areas that improve the interaction with and experience of our candidates with the goal of more effectively and efficiently sourcing, qualifying, matching, deploying, and retaining talent. We continue to drive productivity improvements and a reduced level of turnover in our technology business, which has allowed us to accelerate revenue growth while maintaining a relatively stable level of sales and delivery associates. We expect this trend to continue and believe we have significant capacity available to drive further growth. We don't expect to make material additions to headcounts beyond specific areas where productivity levels are extremely high and building further capacity is warranted. Our simplified business model, client portfolio, and focused service offerings has us well positioned for long-term growth. Our focus on the relationship with our clients and candidates is well recognized as we continue to carry a world-class net promoter score from our clients, 
and Glassdoor's highest rating within our industry. I appreciate the trust our clients and candidates have placed in K-Force and our team's efforts in driving the firm forward. I will now turn the call over to Dave Kelly, K-Force's Chief Financial Officer, who will provide additional insights on operating trends and expectations. Dave? Thanks very much, Joe. Revenues of $336.2 million in the quarter grew 1.8% year-over-year, and earnings per share from continuing operations of $0.66 cents grew 22.2% year-over-year. Our gross profit percentage in the quarter of 29.2% decreased 40 basis points year-over-year as a result of a lower direct higher revenue mix and a decline in our flex gross profit percentage. Our flex gross profit percentage decreased 20 basis points year-over-year. As it relates specifically to the tech flex business, the year-over-year 20 basis point decline is the result of slightly higher health care costs. Bill pay spreads in this business have been stable over the past year due primarily to diversifying and expanding relationships outside of our very largest clients. This next tier of clients typically has a more attractive margin profile. Additionally, Revenue from managed services projects, which also have a more attractive margin profile, is also increasing. The 20 basis point decline in FA flex margins is being driven by slightly lower spreads. Looking forward, we expect continued success in both our portfolio management activities and the growth in revenue from managed services projects. We expect these efforts to result in stable tech flex margins prospectively exclusive of seasonality impacts. Specifically in the first quarter, we expect that overall flex margins will be negatively impacted by approximately 110 basis points relative to Q4 due to seasonal payroll tax resets. We've been able to maintain a consistent level of SG&A dollars spent year over year and drive operating leverage while growing revenues and significantly increasing technology investments. This is the result of continuing to drive operating efficiencies and improving the productivity of our associates. SG&A as a percent of revenue declined 50 basis points year for year. Our fourth quarter operating margin of 5.8% was on track with our operating margin objectives. During this economic cycle, our gross margins have declined by approximately 200 basis points due to a decline in both the percentage of direct hire business and compression in our flex spreads. Despite this compression, operating margins have improved nearly 400 basis points, which reflects our success in deepening relationships in our existing client base while aligning our infrastructure to optimize efficiency in serving these large, complex clients. Our effective tax rate in the fourth quarter was 20%, which was consistent with our expectations. The fourth quarter included a tax benefit related to the vesting of restricted stock of approximately $1.1 million, which reduced the rate in the quarter by approximately 600 basis points. The incremental benefit on a year-over-year basis was driven by the 31% increase in K-Force's stock during 2019. Due to the vesting schedules of our long-term incentive grants, the impact of this discrete adjustment is is reflected almost entirely in the fourth quarter of each year. Our business continues to generate significant operating cash flows, which were $20.1 million in the fourth quarter. We repurchased 700,000 shares of K4 stock in the quarter for $26.5 million. This repurchase completed the deployment of the $102 million in net proceeds from from the KGS divestiture more quickly than we'd anticipated. As a result, as we look forward, we've been able to fully replace the EPS generated from KGS operating performance with EPS accretion from the repurchases. For the full year 2019, Our operating cash flows, coupled with the cash proceeds from my divestitures, allowed us to return nearly $135 million in capital to our shareholders through share repurchases and cash dividends, and also reduced net debt by $26.6 million. Our net debt at the end of the fourth quarter was approximately $45 million, or approximately 0.5 times trailing 12-month EBITDA. The strength of our balance sheet, healthy operating cash flows, low capital requirements, and $300 million credit facility provide us maximum flexibility to both pursue strategic acquisitions that enhance our service offerings and also return capital to our shareholders. There are 64 billing days in the first quarter, which is two days more 
than Q4 and is one day more than the first quarter of 2019. A single billing day equates to roughly $5.4 million in revenue. With respect to guidance, we expect Q1 revenues to be in the range of $333 million to $339 million and for earnings per share to be between 43 and 47 cents. Gross margins are expected to be between, to be between 27.7% and 27.9%, while flex margins are expected to be between 25.6% and 25.8%. SG&A as a percent of revenue is expected to be between 22.9% and 23.1%, and operating margins should be between 4.3% and 4.5%. Weighted average diluted shares outstanding are expected to be approximately 22.2 million. Our anticipated effective tax rate is 26.5% in the first quarter. As a reminder, the first quarter operating margins are typically impacted by approximately 150 basis points due to seasonal impacts of annual payroll tax resets. This also impacts earnings per share by approximately 17 cents. As we mentioned in prior calls, we anticipate an approximately two cent impact related to our share of quarterly losses from the Work Llama joint venture we established in June of 2019. We anticipate that our share of the losses in this joint venture should approximately approximate these levels over the next several quarters. These costs are reflected in other expense on the income statement. Our guidance does not consider the effect, if any, of charges related to any one-time costs, costs or charges related to any pending tax or legal matters, the impact on revenues of any disruption in government funding, or the firm's response to regulatory, legal, or future tax law changes. During the last decade, we've grown revenues in our continuing operations at a compound annual growth rate of 8% and grown earnings per share at a compound annual rate exceeding 20%. Over this same time period, we've repurchased a total of $467 million in stock at an average cost of $19.10 and also returned $120 million to shareholders through our dividend program. As Dave mentioned, our board approved an 11% increase in our quarterly dividend effective in the first quarter, which will return anticipated quarterly cash outlays for dividends to levels approximating those experienced prior to our share repurchases this year and bring the dividend yield to approximately 2%. While we weren't particularly pleased with fourth quarter operating results, we understand that unexpected volatility will periodically occur in client spending and talent acquisition patterns. We remain confident, however, in the overall strength of the market, our strategic direction, and our ability to sustain above market growth rates and continue to improve profitability. We expect 2020 to be another strong year for K-Force and for growth to accelerate as the year progresses. We are poised to take advantage of our competitive differentiators and focus, put, uh, and focus footprint. Our future prospects have never been brighter. Jimmy, I think we're now ready to open the call for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star then the one key on your touchtone telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Toby Summer with SunTrust. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, within the, the tech flex business, could you quantify the impact of elevated furloughs and conversions on the rate of top-line growth? Hi, Toby. Uh, this is Dave Kelly. Um, I don't have the precise number. I would tell you that uh, as we have in, in the past, uh, we typically get furloughs late in the year, but they certainly were magnified this year. I think we probably because of how the holidays fell, um, the fact that both Christmas and New Year's was on Wednesday and we had a very short period of time between Thanksgiving. So I would tell you we anticipated some furloughs, but I mean, I think materially more than we would have anticipated. Additionally, uh, as we talked about, I think really important uh, that, that talks about demand for uh, tech talent, uh, Joe talked about the elevated level of furloughs, uh, or I'm sorry, of conversions that we saw. You combine those things, we're probably talking about collectively somewhere five to eight million dollars more than we had anticipated. Uh, thank you. And, and then I wanted to ask a question on the managed services. 
What sort of margin differential is there in, in, in that part of your business versus the rest of the book? And as you, you know, think about your hitting your target over a multi-year period, um, are, are you going to be able to accomplish that organically or is it going to require some acquisitions? Thanks. Hi, uh, Toby. So um, uh, let me start with the back end, and I'll let Joe elaborate after if he wants to. So uh, clearly this is a um, uh, an important part of our business. It's been growing uh, in well in excess of all of, uh, overall tech flex rates. Uh, I think we've said in the past that um, at these accelerated growth rates, we think we can reach some of the targets that we have internally uh, organically, but, but as we think about acquisitions and, and our focus, it clearly is in this area. Not necessary, but potentially additive. Um, in terms of the margin profile, as you'd expect, um, I guess, number one, first of all, these are longer-term assignments, generally speaking, so good for the overall stability of the revenue stream. I think important to note, they're more sophisticated projects, so, so bill rates uh, are, are strong in these, in, these, um, in these projects. If we kind of look at what we've done so far, um, you know, hard to measure, you know, project by project. Obviously, they're different. But the, the margins, TechFlex margins, are at least 300 basis points better on average than uh, the typical TechFlex staff augmentation uh, project that we would have. Uh, thanks. And last question for me, and I'll get back in the queue. Uh, last quarter, you gave us kind of an illustrative view of um, a little bit longer term, not necessarily guidance, but kind of a cadence. <clears throat> uh, are you still comfortable with the uh, 6% uh, rate of growth or better over a, a longer stretch of time in tech flex? Hi, uh, Toby, this is Dave again. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, so, so as a reminder, obviously we wanted to kind of bring some better understanding uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis to uh, what the impacts of the seasonality of our business were and, and as to your point, give you some reflection of uh, our, what we believe is a very strong environment in tech flex. So I'll remind you, uh, Dave's comment, I think over the last decade, our compound annual growth rate uh, in an environment that continues to evolve and continues to require more tech resources has been 8.5%. So, um, you know, do we think uh, on a sustained basis 6% is a reasonable number to expect from us? Clearly, history, uh, history suggests that it is. So we feel very good. I had mentioned we think as the year goes by, uh, we'll see improvement in our growth rates in TechFlex again, because of the demand environment and because of the skill sets we had deployed. So I yeah, still feel very confident about the market and our prospects. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Marcone with Baird. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just to, to start, at the end of the fourth quarter when you started seeing a, an elevated level of uh, conversions, how, how broad-based was that? Yeah, Mark, uh, this is uh, Joe Libertori. Um, I would say it, it's broad-based, but it was very highly concentrated in what we call our enterprise uh, clients, which are um, some of the largest consumers in the space. Uh, we definitely saw a, a much more elevated uh, levels taking place within those customers. Um, in fact, we just came out of one of our quarterly reviews with one of those key customers, and they actually made the statement that they converted more people than uh, they have ever done in the past. Um, in the in Q4. So we saw that a, a, across a number of key customers. We, we called out specifically uh, financial services, but we also did see that in, in certain other um, large clients as well. Joe, what was the underlying rationale that they provided? I mean, I've got my suspicions, which seem obvious, but just wondering what they were articulating. And then what are they articulating in terms of uh, of thoughts about you know, the same level of activity going forward? Yeah, I'd say the, the real, the, the, key, the key driver to it is the, the nature of this cycle and that really the secular aspects associated with the engagements that they're deploying this talent on. Uh, they foresee the, the long-term need uh, for the talent. So as people have been in there on contract and they've gotten to know the organization, the organization has gotten to know their capabilities, uh, they're basically securing the talent from a long-term standpoint. And I'd say even we see this happening within the financial services, and, you know, it's been out there with certain uh, executives in financial services stating that, you know, they're preparing for imminent uh, recession at some given point in time. 
Um, I believe, as I read through those tea leaves, what they're saying is we're going to need these resources irrespective of what happens in the, the market. Uh, so even in, in a recessionary period, they're going to have to continue to deploy, um, you know, those applications that are customer-facing, uh, consumer-driven, to stay competitive with traditional and non-traditional players. So I think that's playing a big, a big part in it. If that continues and it and it goes at a potentially increasing rate, um, you know, to what extent does that end up making it more difficult to achieve the the six percent uh, longer term growth rate? Yeah, we we feel we feel confident with uh, the 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 six percent six percent. What we're seeing partially happening here, Mark, is basically things are moving from a from a direct hire where you would typically see that in a direct hire uh, to these right to hire or conversions. So it's kind of it's just moving from one bucket to the other bucket. Doesn't change the overall demand uh, within the space. Uh, so we don't really have concerns about that. I, I, we've been stating this for the better part of the last three or four years. It was probably about four years ago where we saw conversion levels. Uh, start to escalate higher than what we had experienced in the past, and they've remained at those levels. Uh, this Q4, in particular, uh, was was you know as David as I had mentioned, 50% higher uh, for us than we experienced last year, and that was very specific um, to certain uh, certain clients uh, and their talent strategy. So I wouldn't extrapolate that that was uh, something that was broad based across the entire sector. Yeah, I would add, Mark, just a little bit more color. So during the cycle, just generally, you know, obviously we've seen a fair amount uh, of conversion activity consistently. This was, as Joe said, a heightened quarter here. But but even with that elevated relative to last cycle conversion activity, as I mentioned, our TechFlex growth rates are still um, uh, are still eight and a half percent. You know, additionally, as we talk about lengthening assignment. And, um, you know, we, we also talk about, uh, some, some of the individuals that we might have on assignment, uh, that are more difficult to con- convert. I, I think, you know, frankly, we feel very good about the sustainability of the revenue stream. Uh, and of course, clients are going to want talent, but being able to outrun that, uh, we've got a high degree of confidence. And the, la- the last piece that I would add on to that, Mark, and I've mentioned this, um, in the past, having entered this industry, really on the direct hire front back in 1988. Um, there's no greater compliment we get than when a consultant converts to full-time employment uh, with an organization because that means our people are living out our mission, our vision, that we're, we're getting the right people with the right organization. So while there's some you know near-term pain associated with losing that billable, the long-term gain to the organization by having an ally inside the organization and somebody that we've helped further their career and also solve a client problem, I mean, there, it's, it's, it's well worth the, the near-term pain associated with that uh, from, from how it plays out in terms of what we're doing for people's careers. That's a great perspective. Um, with, with regards to... Um you know the, the the talent management system uh, that's that's going to be deployed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the productivity gains and also, um, you know, potential expense savings that you may end up getting as well, and how you're thinking about that? Yeah, I'll I'll touch upon the the productivity and then I'll hand it over to uh, Dave to talk about from the expense standpoint. Um, you know, in reality, what we're doing here is we're, we're moving into uh, completely digitizing um, how we're interacting with our, our clients and candidates uh, within our, our talent relationship management. This kind of mirrors what we've done uh, from a client relationship management, so it allows us to kind of bring that holistic solution uh, to the table. So what we foresee over time is what the technology will allow us to do is to leverage those things that technology is capable of accelerating so that our people can spend much more of their time focused on the relationship um, aspects of the business, the things that only people can do, especially in the employment space, which is highly complex uh, as people are navigating their careers. You know, so when it comes to things such as identification of talent, when it comes to you know, matching and those types of things, that's where we see uh, a lot of opportunity for technology to come into play uh, to drive efficiencies and productivity for our individuals um, so that they can focus in on, 
you know, working with people through the more complex, uh, you know, human interaction relationship aspects that, that take place through uh, really any type of employment, whether it be uh, temporary employment or from a, you know, a full-time direct hire standpoint. Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, this is Dave Kelly. So let me start uh, when you talk about expense by um, um, starting with the end, which is we've made operating margin commitments with the full expectation that these technology investments are going to continue to drive increasing productivity and therefore increasing operating margins. So they're already baked in to the expectations that we've had. And, and, and we know that because over the course of the last few years, you know, we've in, implemented a, a CRM. We're in the process of making other technology investments inclusive of this TRM, and, and those are currently driving the beginning part of productivity improvement. So um, these are SaaS-based licenses. They're being baked in to SG&A, but SG&A is staying flat. I think I'd mentioned SG&A dollars year over year are flat year over year. So um, we feel very confident that we're going to get improved productivity, improved efficiency. Actually, SG&A dollars as a percentage of revenue are going to go down over time, um, even with these incremental costs. Um, and, and EPS, obviously, is going to continue to improve. So this is all part of a long-term strategy, no different than what we've been talking about for the last few years. Uh, thanks. Thanks for confirming that. Um, I, I was assuming that the, the cost would go down over time and uh, the efficiencies would go up. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be putting it in. I, I was just wondering if you were running, like, dual costs and if there was any going to be any sort of step function, uh, you know, in terms of, all right, once the implementation's done um, and the old system's off and everybody's on, um, that there'll be a step function. So that's what I was just trying to get at. Okay. Um, and would there potentially be any sort of step function once the completion's done? The, 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 step, the step function that you would see there that, that would basically improve um, operating leverage in comparison to cost is going to come through acceleration of productivity, um, Mark, because of the nature of how systems have changed from there really being a CapEx item uh, to everything migrating to more SaaS licensing. Because realize what we're doing with our TRM is the TRM is just the core platform. Uh, that platform now allows us to plug in a lot of innovative technologies that are evolving in the marketplace, which will then kind of be accelerators to productivity gain opportunities uh, for our associates. Great. And, and David, in your opening comments, um, you know, it, it did seem like you were talking a little bit more about, um, you know, potentially the, you've already been doing things in terms of managed services, um, you know, potentially looking at, um, you know, acquisitions. Can you just give a, you know, given the, the wide experiences that you've had um, and all the lessons learned over the, the decades, like, what are some of the ideal characteristics that you would be looking for um, in, in terms of selecting a, a, a potential uh, add-on to the, the overall platform? Actually, we were thinking about running a Super Bowl ad, Mark, to, um, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, kind of lay I wonder how many dirt. people remember. We, um, as a matter of uh, record, we opened our board meeting with a 20-year um, look back and ran the Super Bowl ad. Um, by the way, it, was, uh, it, turned, it was surprisingly prophetic um, as we looked at the things that we anticipated, um, and we were reminiscing about um, how we had the vision. We just happened to miss um, the technology infrastructure that was necessary to deliver on the brilliant strategy that we had. Uh, we do note that uh, a couple of the firms that were identified in the Super Bowl ad, Hot Jobs and Monster, are now gone, um, who had uh, indicated to us that, uh, that we were going to be gone. So, uh, But, you know, if we look back on it, we made a call back in 12 and 13 to, uh, to focus on technology, domestic tech. We, we could see clearly the secular shift, um, and during that time, we've also seen the migration up uh, with the clients as they're looking to us, uh, particularly with agile methodologies and the other tools that are coming in, the speed of, uh, of innovation um, to utilize our firm and our services to come upstream. Um, so um, as we look at that, 
Uh, we've seen the opportunity. We've had a very disciplined uh, acquisition strategy over the past several years. We'll point out that we haven't done an, an acquisition since 2008. Uh, we've had a very focused effort to accomplish that. A whole team, we've identified characteristics that we're looking for, size that we're looking for, skill sets that we're looking for. Uh, one of the important elements is the continuing uh, uh, contribution from management. Uh, we believe we have a great story to tell as we integrate and populate uh, the skill sets into our organization. Um, number one consideration is culture. How well do they fit with us? So uh, we feel very confident that, um, uh, that based on where we are that we will identify something um, but we are going to stay disciplined uh, when we do. It's, um, it's going to be additive. It's not something we have to do, as we've uh, demonstrated that organically we can grow and still grow very well. Uh, rates within our, our solutions and team businesses are growing at substantially faster rates than tech, uh, than uh, our traditional tech business. Um, but, we do, um, but we do believe that, uh, that we will identify something. Um, we don't have to do it, but we would like to do it. Um, so all those that are listening on the call that would like to join the team, we'd be happy to, uh, to have a conversation. David, and you, I know culture is preeminent and, and obviously strategic fit. From a size perspective, how, what's kind of the, the ideal parameter? Um, we could do, depending on pricing, of course, uh, we could go anywhere into uh, the, the hundreds um, I don't think that we're going to do something in the billions yet, but uh, that may be coming. But uh, certainly in the revenue area in the hundreds uh, would make sense, um, 100 plus. Um, we'd like to get something with enough scale that it would uh, give us a platform, um, but at the same time would also uh, allow us to, um, to, to take what they've already done and roll that out to our other clients uh, uh, with some of the qualifications that they've already demonstrated. So we would bring that also in with our what we've already accomplished, which, um, by the way, is pretty substantial. Uh, um, it's amazing to see just how quickly we've been able to uh, to grab a hold of some, some very, very significant managed solutions kinds of businesses. It's one, Mark, it's one of the big, big opportunities is, you know, those organizations that we have spoke with up to this point in time, uh, they see the value being associated with uh, a, a, somebody at the scale of a K-Force and the access to the pedigree um, client portfolio uh, that our people have nurtured relationships. So, you know, this is one of those scenarios where we are looking for, you know, one plus one to be much greater than uh, two as we consider uh, those, those targets that we're pursuing. Terrific. I appreciate the perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Feel better, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tim Mulroney with William Blair. Your line is now open. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Um, so in your prepared remarks, you mentioned length of assignment now, 10 months in tech flex. Uh, if I recall correctly, not it wasn't that long ago that it was eight months and even six months only a few years ago. So what, what's driving that increase in the length of assignment, and what are the implications, if any, that has on your financial profile if it continues to increase? Yeah, I'll, I'll address the first part, and then I'll let um, uh, Dave Kelly address <laughs> the implications on the, the financials. From from a standpoint of what's driving it, it's it's just the the nature of what's happening um, in business. You know, much of the work that we're doing now is focused on uh, the customer facing type of um, applications uh, that organizations are addressing, so that they can serve uh, their consumer base um, and they can protect either their footholds uh, relative to organizations that are coming at them from a disruptive standpoint, the non traditionals as well as uh, their traditional uh, competitors that are making strides on these fronts. So, you know, we're not – the nature of this environment in comparison to, like, what we saw during a dot-com environment, which dot-com, everybody was trying to figure out, you know, what's this new medium and how am I going to do business on this new medium? Uh, you know, those days are past, and, and everybody now has the, the Internet somewhat figured out, and what's happening is now there's these platform plays coming about, which is how do I leverage the technology to drive operational efficiencies and improve the customer experience and the customer journey? 
And so we see those as, as ongoing, and I think that's part of what's driving um, the duration of assignment is it's moving from one project to the next project to the next project, so they're keeping the consultants and basically rolling them from engagement to engagement and engagement. You know, unlike the past when somebody's implementing an ERP system and somebody might be in there for two years because it was just this, you know, ma massive project that was going on and on and on. So I'd say that's one driver. The other driver is, is the nature of the types of engagements that we're working with um, with our end customers, uh, where they're looking for us to take on a little bit more of the responsibility within the engagement. Uh, so we're moving up that value chain, and we're playing a different role on that project versus just putting somebody in in a staff aug spot um, on a team. You know, we're putting in groups of individuals that are playing key roles in the nature of the project work that's type, uh, that's taking place. So, uh, you know, it's really when you kind of put those two things together, those are some of the market drivers that are really extending uh, those project durations. And the, the third piece of the leg of this stool is just top talent is not easy to find. So when, when organizations are procuring top talent and they realize they have that top talent, they're wanting to hold on to that talent and looking for other opportunities where they can redeploy that talent because they know how difficult it is to go back out into the market to procure that same level of talent all over again, if they can even get it. So, so Tim, uh, before a little on the financials, but first of all, just to amplify Joe's point, remember our average bill rate is $75 an hour. You look across the technology space, it's amongst the highest. That is also the place where it's hardest to find talent. So the desire for our clients to find in that, that higher paid talent um, is, is something, again, I think that differentiates our firm. So that is driving some of that, I think, tenure uh, increase. In terms of what it does for our financials, it would, it would, I mean, again, not, not surprising as to what you'd expect. When you've got lengthening assignments, you've got uh, the opportunity for um, our associates to work on those, those other things, right? It helps with revenue growth. It helps with productivity. Certainly, it helps with turnover of our associates. Uh, it helps on many different fronts. So, um, and again, meeting the client's needs, our clients are happy they're going to come to us and, again, give us an opportunity because we have access to that top talent uh, for opportunities that, you know, others might not see. So it's got multiple positive impacts for us. Got it. Uh, very helpful. Thank you, and good luck this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and as a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star then one on your touchtone telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Our next question comes from John Healy with North Coast Research. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you. I um, wanted to ask a big picture question, um, looking at 2019 and kind of uh, the rear view. I know there's a lot of moving parts with weather and client activity and things like that, but if you just looked at orders um, or, you know, potential assignments, how would you characterize that growth relative to revenue growth for the company on the IT flex side in, in 2019 and, and maybe how that might compare to the last couple of years? Yeah, this is uh, Joe. I, I would say from an order flow, order flow um, has been at, at elevated levels and has continued to be at elevated levels. In fact, as uh, this year started out, uh, we saw order flow immediately uh, pick right back up to where it left off. Um, so the demand in the marketplace, the, the health of the market, um, I've been doing this going on 32 years now. <clears throat> the closest comparison that I can give in terms of uh, this demand environment was the peak of the, the dot-com era. I, as I mentioned earlier, I do believe what we're dealing with from a business standpoint today versus dot-com is very different. Uh, because of the, the technology drivers are much more secular versus cyclical or panic-driven uh, like the dot-com was. Organizations realize that they need to be making these investments. The investments are proven out to be real and obtainable in terms of driving business results, so much different from that standpoint. So we've, we've really seen, uh, we've seen no blips at all from an order flow standpoint and demand standpoint. Great, no, that's helpful. And then um, just a couple of housekeeping questions for me. Um, is there a way to think about um, tax rate for this year as well as potential just um, CapEx for this year? Yeah, so, John, uh, this is Dave Kelly. So CapEx is going to be uh, about where it has been, right? So we typically see about $10 million the last couple of years because of some of the technology investments that we're making. So not 
meaningful when you think about the cash flows that we generate. Uh, in terms of tax rate, I think I'd indicated to you that the expectation of tax rate in the first quarter is 26 and a half. Um, that is uh, an expectation that I would have uh, on, a, on a regular basis throughout the year. Obviously, I mentioned this quarter, and we would see the same, although to a lesser impact, uh, um, re- uh, tax credit in the fourth quarter next year is the next tranche of long-term incentives uh, fast. But, I, again, I don't think it's going to be a 600 basis point impact. It's probably, again, it depends on how, how high the stock goes this year uh, as to how big of a difference it is. You kind of look for the full year. You kind of blend the fourth quarter in. You're probably looking at closer to 26%. Great. Thank you, guys. You bet. Thanks, John. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions in the queue at this time. I will now turn the call back to David Dunkel, Chairman and CEO, for any closing remarks. Okay, great. Well, thank you all uh, for your interest and support for KForce. And while we always have much to do, uh, again, I'd like to say thank you to each and every member of our field and corporate teams and to our consultants and our clients for allowing us the privilege of serving you. And as we've stated, we believe that uh, the future for KForce is very bright. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation on today's conference. This does conclude your program, and you may now disconnect.